Well, welcome to our third show in March of uh, Culturally Appropriate. I'm clearly your host, Jared Hollyfield. So we've got a packed show today. It's a very film-heavy episode since we're working in the wake of the Oscars. Our first guest is probably not going to be talking about a lot of movies that were nominated for Oscars, though. And our first guest is Jake Tibbs, who is the president of the TriStar Trash Cinema, which is a uh, Cinema Club that started in the Cumberland region of Tennessee. That is really fantastic. I went to their first meeting a couple of weeks ago. Next, we're going to talk about the best films of 2023. And as always, we're going to end with our weekly film rundown of all the fun stuff that's playing in and around the Nashville area. So, Jake, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Jared. Uh, I'm ecstatic to be here and be able to talk about uh, movies with you. Yeah, and I will say before we get started... I'm super excited about Monday at the Putnam County Library because you're going to be showing the movie Chopping Mall, which is one of my favorite 80s movies of all time. I plan to wear my Chopping Mall t-shirt from the amazing company Fright Rags. And I'm not just saying that because they co-sponsor our film festival that I'm running in a couple of weeks that we're going to talk about on the show next week. But I'm so excited for Chopping Mall. Again, one of my favorite movies. If you've not seen this movie, I can't talk it up enough. I've never seen it with an audience. I'm guessing you haven't either, right? I haven't. No, this is going to be a really special occasion. Yeah. So I went to your first meeting uh, about three weeks ago when you showed a movie that I hadn't really heard much about called The Dark Tower, which blew me away. And it was so cool watching that with an audience in this really nice library room. I mean, so do you want to tell us a little bit about why you started this particular cinema club? Absolutely. Uh, basically, I would say that this dates back to my admiration of different B-movie celebration projects, whether we are looking at Mystery Science Theater 3000, the beloved television series, or whether we're talking about something uh, on YouTube like Red Letter Media's Best of the Worst. Those two programs, I think, exemplify better than anything else that B-movies are meant to be experienced and are best experienced in the sense of community. When we look at Best of the Worst with Red Letter Media, you have this group of friends that are unbelievably authentic. And through watching this, this low-tier cinema, you can see that friendship develop on screen and that bond be strong. And it's the same thing with Mystery Science Theater 3000 uh, with those characters, whether we're talking the human characters or the puppets. So I wanted to bring something similar to Cookville. Cookville, uh, it's got people doing incredible stuff with the arts, whether we're talking about the visual arts, like painting and sculpture with the folks at the Silver Fern. They're doing a great job. We have plenty of musical and dramatic things through the Cookville Performing Arts Center, but... There's nothing really for movies beyond our regular AMC theater, which is a commercial enterprise, not so much an appreciation enterprise. I wanted to bring something as small as it is and as uh, maybe unnotable as I am, I wanted to bring that to Cookville and develop that bond through bad movies, quote unquote, bad, just like the folks on Red Letter Media, just like the folks on Mystery Science 3000 had. And so far, it's gone swimmingly. Yeah, and I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing how it's going to grow in the next meeting on Monday. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to love the movies in the first place? Not just bad movies, which we're going to talk about those quotes in a second, but movies in general. So I would say just as a general introduction to myself, I am a ninth grade English teacher at Livingston Academy, uh, which is about 20 minutes from my home in Cookville, Tennessee. Uh I got both my bachelor's degree and my master's degree at Tennessee Tech here in Cookville. I moved here in 2017 and have resided here ever since. But as for my life, well, before I moved to movies, one small thing. Uh, to quote Peter Falk, just one more thing. Uh, I have to mention that one of my defining traits is my love for my cat, Mal, who is uh, always teaches me how to smile every day. But as, as for the movies now, I would say that my entry point began as a kid. And it was not a special entry point by any means. Like most people, the movies I loved as a kid were Disney animation, Star Wars, superhero movies, very obvious building blocks, but those were the building blocks I had. 
when I truly got into film as an art form, though, was in 2014. I still remember exactly how it happened. I was in my room watching on my iPad mini on Netflix, Pulp Fiction. And I completely understand that there's nothing unique about a teenage boy having his eye opened by Pulp Fiction. That happens to basically every teenage cinephile. They fall in love with the works of Quentin Tarantino. But for me, that was my moment. Uh, and for the next few years of my life, I seemingly, for better or worse, probably for worse, uh, shaped my personality on Quentin Tarantino. Since then, obviously, I've moved beyond that one filmmaker when it comes to my obsessions. Uh, at the moment, I'm most enamored with Brian De Palma, John Woo, Jess Franco, John Ford. But that, that experience watching Pulp Fiction really opened my eyes to film as an art form and becoming more concerned with the people behind the work more than I was with the work itself. Because I think that's where the beauty of the cinema comes from, is with the artists, with the auteurs. Yeah. So we've talked about Pulp Fiction. We're, we're big Tarantino fans here at The Pamphleteer. I reviewed Cinema Speculation, and uh, we got the chance to talk to Gulla Avery, who produces Tarantino and her father's podcast, and an article I read about VHS about a year ago. So... Tarantino's very near and dear to our hearts as well, but also Tarantino's love of quote unquote bad movies. So you talked about Pulp Fiction, but what was the the trash movie that really turned you on to kind of the subgenre of film? So just like with in 2014, I remember my special moment watching Pulp Fiction. I have my special moment with the trash movie. And that was... 2010 or 2011, I know I was in middle school, I was browsing the guide feature on DirecTV, and I saw that a movie called Dracula vs. Frankenstein was going to come on later that night. This is a film that is often considered one of the worst ever made, and that's a term used all the time. But in the case of Dracula vs. Frankenstein, there have been quite a few books that genuinely consider it one of the worst films ever made. I didn't know any of that when I was 11 or 12. That title, of course, I had grown up with the Universal Monster movies, loving Dracula, the Wolfman, Frankenstein. I saw that title, Dracula versus Frankenstein, and instantly I'm watching that movie when it comes on in a few hours. I'm watching that. And when I watched it, I fully recognized that something was off about it. I know I had seen movies I didn't like as a kid because I was 11 when I saw this, I believe. I know I'd seen movies I didn't like as a kid, but I don't think I'd ever really seen a B movie before this. Dracula versus Frankenstein with its very off, unconvincing acting with the clearly cheap sets and the really strange atmosphere that was just odd and surreal to me. Something felt different about it and I was enamored with it. I thought the aesthetics in the early 70s cheap grindhouse stuff was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. And it's still influenced my aesthetic tastes today. And the film directed by Al Adamson, one of the Schlockmeisters of all time, I would say, and shot by the great Gary Graver, Orson Welles' friend. Uh, the film has a surreal, transportive atmosphere. And I think that boils down to one reason I love these shoddy productions so much in B-movies. I think that in some ways they're more transported than anything else. Uh, the, the low budget, the making the best of bad circumstances, something about that I think is more transportive than the most expensive uh, Hollywood tentpoles. And Dracula versus Frankenstein opened my eyes. And after that, I, I couldn't stop seeking out similar films. And here I am today. Yeah, I know that in the past, whenever we've had conversations, We've talked about kind of the soullessness in a lot of recent films, especially big budget movies. So you look at a movie like Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, and no one's going to say that that movie is on par at all with something like Raiders of the Lost Ark. But that's a very expensive movie. Or you talk about a, you know, some of these DC movies recently, like The Flash or Aquaman. And I know you kind of had a terrible week in your life whenever you went to go see Dial of Destiny and The Flash almost back to back. And I feel in a lot of ways that these movies are kind of made fun of. They have kind of this low reputation in society, but I often feel like they're warmer and more human than a lot of the stuff that's coming out in the box office right now. I don't know how you feel about that. I, I fully agree with you. Um, they're far more authentic. They lack the, uh, the digital 
obsession that seemed to be on display in the flash and dial of destiny where at a certain point it felt like i wasn't even watching cinema it felt like i was watching and i it's cliched and half to say it but cutscenes in a video game i mean the entire thing was just digital nonsense it was not someone shooting something with a camera because they wanted to capture something amazing or capture an amazing feeling it was something meant to fill in a point on a spreadsheet for a company's quarterly earnings and and that just absolutely breaks my heart that the most the most prominent films out there are like that when in comparison we have these low budget b movies where someone with a camera just wants to capture a feeling and convey it and there's just something so much more human and authentic about that than what we get in the corporate uh, the corporatized Wall Streetized film world of today. Yeah, and I think in some ways we're kind of seeing a little bit of reaction to that. So this seems like a pretty perfect time to start a club like this because, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later in the show, but you had movies like Little Mermaid and The Flash and Dial of Destiny like not do as well as studios thought. You know, everybody thought five years ago before COVID, we can make a soulless version of The Lion King that isn't actually even a cartoon or cinema and it's certainly not live action and it's going to gross $2 billion. So consumers are just going to lap this up and we're kind of in an environment like now where that's not the case. Um, we see people gravitating to movies like Saltburn or Poor Things that have a, really a lot more in common with the kind of movies that you're talking about than they do with Hollywood cinema. So it seems like a nice time for a club like this to be in existence and especially to be getting started at this point. I mean, I saw more people in that room three weeks ago watching The Dark Power than I did when I went to go see The Flash a week after it came out, which I think is it's pretty heartening, right? Makes you feel pretty good, I would imagine. A absolutely. Uh, I I was so, so pleased that at our first meeting, we had 16 people in attendance. That I was expecting just a couple, and I was expecting them all to be people I had met through real life, like coworkers and friends. But the fact that we were able to get 16 people to leave their home, go to a room with a bunch of people that they don't know, and listen to a guy with very little qualification talk about something as obscure and minor as the dark power, that was just the greatest thing. And through people marking our Facebook event link on the TriStar Trash Cinema um, Facebook page, we're on track to have more people in attendance next time than we did on the first meeting. And it's hard for me to describe how happy that makes me. Uh, I'm so glad people are willing to give this a chance and to, to give this thing that I started, but certainly it's a thing that we will, we the club will maintain and keep going. Yeah, and I wanted to put a little plug in for Cookville too. Um, we've had on the owners of Plenty Bookshop around Christmas to sort of talk about their holiday list, which is one of my favorite bookshops. I feel like in many ways, Cookville's fast becoming my favorite area of Tennessee. And you wouldn't really know that by just driving by it on the interstate and like seeing the Logan's Roadhouse sign and some of the fast food signs. But it's a city that really has a lot of distinct culture. I mean, there's only one Cookville in America, obviously, but there's just so much going on there artistically. And a lot of it is the fact that you've got a college there, but it seems like that community outside the college is really, really kind of making a name for the city, wanting to stay there and actually thriving. I mean, you know, it's, it sort of reminds me of, you know, maybe Nashville in some ways or corners of Nashville about 15 years ago, or you know, I wasn't alive for this, but like, you know, Austin of the time of Richard Linklater's Slocker, like, there's just so much and it's such a supportive environment as well. And I mean, I'm not, I don't live in Cookville, but I just kind of get that, that high every time that I go there. Um, am I exaggerating? I think that Cookville has some incredible stuff going for it. I, I've been here in the past seven years. Uh, like I said, I moved here in 2017 after I graduated high school. Uh, I'll soon be turning 25, but you're absolutely correct. And just in the seven years I've been here, there has certainly been a change and growing and cultivation of the arts. It, it really does have a personality. And like you said, our university here, I won't credit the university for the good that's come, but I think the university has brought so many great thinkers and cultivators and curators to Cookville. So because of that university, we have people that come here and stay here 
and get to do great things. Not to put myself on any of the level of those people, but I'm someone who came to Cookville because of the university and I've stayed. And now with the small, small wave and I'm contributing to its culture, cultural cultivation, I, I, I'm getting to do that too and participate in it. And it really is special. And I love the comparison you made to Austin, uh, Austin, Texas. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a comparison that I think about a lot just because you've had these very distinct southern cities kind of emerging. And they're now challenging those coastal hubs that we often think of as the only place there's culture in America, which you know, I would argue that in a lot of ways, a city like Cookville or clearly a city like Nashville and Austin, I'd rather be in that cultural milieu than I would in New York City or Los Angeles. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about this idea of trash cinema, because it seems to me to be one of those kind of reappropriated words that's really been taken back. Um, and, you know, I'm saying this as somebody that really does kind of look at a lot of the, the meaning behind these movies. I mean, you know, we can kind of say there's like an artist like Yorgos Lanthimos, who we're going to talk about a little bit later with his movie Poor Things, that's very intentional about the same kind of stuff that he's doing. And then you might have people that are also artists, but might be a little more unrefined who are doing things. And I mean, I think of someone like Stephanie Meyer in Twilight, who we wouldn't put on the level of, you know, a great literary presence, but those books have a lot of interesting things to say about settlers and, and natives and the indigenous population. Um, you know, trash cinema, we know a lot of it was just kind of a naked cash grab for a lot of people. Um, but we also know that that created an environment for a lot of artists to really thrive. So my question to you is, is, is trash cinema really trash? Because when I look at a movie like The Dark Power, I'm not going to say that The Dark Power is anywhere as well staged or shot as a movie like Killers of the Flower Moon. But I think in a lot of ways that I would say that movie makes some more salient points about native extermination and colonization and um, settler and native relations than Killers of the Flower Moon does. And that's, I'm saying that as a person who liked Killers of the Flower Moon, but also saw some of those flaws. Like I would rather watch The Dark Power over Killers of the Flower Moon any day. I'd rather watch The Dark Power twice and a half instead of Killers of the Flower Moon again. So, um, and I feel the same way with Chopping Mall too. Uh, you know, Jim Wynarski, we wouldn't say is Quentin Tarantino, but Chopping Mall is a very political movie. Chopping Mall is a movie that's very much a part of its time. So is this cinema really trash? And are are we hurting it by calling it trash? I think that you mentioned reappropriation of the name. That is a great way of, of, uh, of putting it. If we think back to the 1980s during the video store boom and the VHS boom, so many of these movies were derided as complete filth, as garbage. Um, we had commissions in our uh, Ronald Reagan government that were very against violence and pressured the MPAA to restrict what people could see, even outside of theaters on home video in their own home. Uh, and then, of course, you have what happened in the UK with the video nasties. Uh, the, the censorship of the trash cinema was just unbelievable. But now, in 2024, and, and in the past decade or so, we've really reclaimed it with the people who grew up with this stuff growing up and now being able to share why it's valuable. Uh, but I, I think that there's the very little cinema that I would consider completely devoid of merit. And if it is devoid of merit, it's because I feel like there is a corporation behind it instead of an artist. And that's exactly how I felt about Flash and Dial of Destiny. It did not feel like a filmmaker, as I said before, it did not feel like a filmmaker was sharing a message or an idea or an experience that mattered to them. It was a corporation. With so-called trash cinema, uh, when we gaze through a camera lens, I think there's always something to appreciate, whether that be the unique worldview, whether that be fascinating subtext, whether that be impressive photography or an abundance of other qualities. Uh, just because personnel involved lacks experience, financing or conventional material, it doesn't necessarily mean their work is automatically devoid of value. On the contrary, I would say the B-movie scene frequently boasts craft and craftsmen that, in my opinion, carry far more subtextual weight than a work from a mainstream studio. Uh, you mentioned Chopping Mall and the Dark Power. Both of those films, an average Joe might look at and think, well, oh, that's just schlocky drivel. Look at that poster. I mean, Chopping Mall has the iconic tagline. It's where shopping costs you an arm and a leg. Uh, 
So it'd be easy to look at that and think it's nothing. Or at best, an average Joe might think that might just be so so good, it, so bad it's good at best. But in my opinion, there's no such thing as a guilty pleasure in film. That's my perfect opinion. Films are either interesting or they're not. And works like The Dark Power and Chopping Mall are both very, very interesting and both have so much to say about the world we live in. Something I can't say about so much uh, tentpole films these days. So I think trash cinema has so much more humanity and value to it than people give it credit. And because that they have so much interest, there's no way someone can tell me The Dark Power or Chopping Mall are trash. No way. Or Dracula versus Frankenstein. And I mean, we're, we're talking about The Flash and Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, and it's not like those filmmakers were just kind of warm bodies either. I mean, we're talking about Anthony Muschietti, who, at least from, in my opinion, did a great job on the first It movie, and Mama that he made with Jessica Chastain, and Jim Mangold, who has made some really great indies like Copland before he sort of graduated into the Wolverine universe, and Logan was, Logan was a pretty great entry and considered one of the best superhero movies of all time as well. Um, but it seems like this corporate apparatus is really stifling them. I mean, we have artists who break through like Nolan or Tarantino who are just too big to fail. Or we might have those moments like Greta Gerwig making a movie like Barbie that is working at both of these levels, which is something I talk about in my Poor Things uh, piece today. It's coming out, I think, in about an hour or so. Um, but when I look at a movie like Chopping Mall, it says so much about 80s culture. And... It does have that distinct filmmaker vibe, but, and I'm writing about this in the uh, in the amazing zine that we're going to talk about here in a second that you publish with uh, with each meeting of the club. But if we're thinking about Chopping Mall and what it means in terms of, and for those of you who don't know, do you want to explain the plot of Chopping Mall really quickly to, uh, to our Chopping audience? Mall, Chopping Mall, uh, directed by the iconic B-movie filmmaker Jim Wynorski and coming from Roger Corman's production company and uh, directly produced by his wife, Julie. Chopping Mall is the story of a group of teens, young adults that get trapped in a mall one night when they decide to stick around and misbehave. But the issue is there's not a security guard looking for them. There's not even a masked killer looking for them. There's the mall's new kill bots. They're state-of-the-art machines that are going to run security at the mall. And due to a lightning storm and some frying of the control panels, these killbots start to hunt down the children. Um, or excuse me, more so teens or young adults. It, it's, an, it's an incredible film uh, at a lean 76 minutes, which I love to hear that. Uh, it's fantastic. And it has so much to say about consumerism in America at the time. And I think it makes for an interesting comparison to George Romero's Dawn of the Dead, which also had a lot to say about malls and consumerism during the Jimmy Carter years. Chopping Mall amps it up even further during the ultra-consumerism, ultra-Reaganist uh, uh, economics of the mid-1980s. Yeah, and something that I'm talking about in the piece that I'm writing for, for this zine is Chopping Mall's got one foot in the Terminator Cold War, don't trust the machines kind of paranoia that came out of the 80s. But the other thing about it, too, is there was this sort of anxiety that's manifest in a lot of movies about Japanese technology. So, you know, thinking about a movie like Robocop, which has this amazing fake ad um, for the SUX car, and it's a Godzilla ad. So, this Japanese car that is causing anxiety for people, or a movie like Gremlins, which is really about how people are afraid of the economic dominance of Japan and Japanese electronics, because the gremlins live in the electronics. Um, we see this anxiety kind of all over a lot of these 80s films that we consider kind of you know, Spielberg, Lucas productions. Um, I mean, even that opening scene of Back to the Future, where it really does sort of lay out Doc Brown's failure as an inventor in the wake of all of these Japanese music electronics and Sony and all of these foreign cars where people are going, all the teenagers are going to go buy Japanese cars. So there is this anxiety, and for me, Chopping Mall is a really important movie related to that because of the fact that it takes it to like high noon or high midnight, I guess, in the case of Chopping Mall. But this is happening at the source, right? I mean, it's it's Fast Times at Ridgemont High with these monsters. It's really showing that undercurrent of anxiety that's plaguing the 80s about is American economic dominance actually a real thing or is Japan 
going to usurp the interventions of America. So I think there's a lot of parallels to make too with this movie where we can look at it from the point of view of AI gone amok and people being replaced for their jobs or even the sort of dominance of China over our entire culture. So, I mean, I hope I'm not hard selling the movie and people are like, oh, wow. Right, this is, right. This is not uh, what these guys were talking about in the show the other day. But I mean, the I, AI, I, I, the I, AI I statement this. is excellent. Uh, the AI thing, that's so true. I'm someone who's very concerned about that, of course. And I think... I think a certain kill in Chopping Mall. It's funny that I worry about spoiling uh, the 1986 <laughs> film Chopping Mall, but there's a certain kill of a working class person at the hands of these AI robots that I think is really profound when you think of it as AI replacing working class human labor. And that scene with a wonderful actor, uh, Dick Miller. It's very true. Very, very true and profound statement, I think, of the threat AI poses even today, 38 years later. Yeah, and I will say Dick Miller, too, is an actor that was in a lot of Joe Dante movies. So um, you might remember him as Mr. Futterman in Gremlins, who's the guy that's concerned because he fought in World War II about all of these electronics and the Gremlins coming over. So um, Dick Miller's kind of like the unofficial figure of the yellow peril, peril generation, I guess. I love in that. In some ways. I but yeah, that. I mean... Phenomenal, phenomenal actor, that guy. I think he just passed away recently, too. He did. He did. He passed away a few years ago. I highly recommend, uh, if I'm allowed to make a recommendation, I highly recommend on Tubi, they have a, a documentary all about uh, about him called That Guy Dick Miller, which is an incredible retrospective of his career and the man himself talking about it later in his life. I, I highly recommend that if you're interested in the figure of Dick Miller. Yeah, he's a fan, one of my favorite character actors and just like such a welcome presence in any movie that he's in, for sure. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how this dovetails with your day job, because, you know, I I can't imagine in some ways in a movie like Chopping Mall, too. Um, I mean, it, it's it's a very counterculture film, too. I mean, we have Paul Bartel in Chopping Mall kind of reprising his role from eating Raul in the very beginning of the movie. Um, you know, two movies that I would think like I would not want a ninth grader. Actually, my ninth grader, I'd be totally fine with him watching either of these movies. I'm lying. But. I would imagine like a lot of parents might not like you know, <laughs> chopping mall or uh, eating Raul, something for their, their kids to see, especially um, mm -hmm. out of school. So how do you sort of reconcile this part of your life with your day job? Uh, for one, it helps that I teach in a separate community than the one I live in and the one I cultivate this club in. So that that's a very helpful aspect of it. Another is that I've, I've set some certain ground rules for myself and the club on what I will allow to be shown. Uh, there's a level that I don't think the Dark Power or Chopping Mall cra uh, cross in terms of inappropriate content. Um, violence is one thing. Sexual content is one thing. But these films do not cross a barrier that I think would just be inappropriate, not only for me to uh, oversee, um, nor do I ever want to show something super inappropriate at a place like the library because that that I, I think that that's just not okay but one of the things about the club is i, I stress that if we're showing an r-rated film you will not be there if you are not over 17 uh, i will not allow you to come in but also i i do not invite students uh the only students that i have even let know that this exists um are ones that are adults now themselves uh but it is something that I have been conscious of, and I try to keep it at an appropriate appropriate enough level. Uh, and of course, I don't really talk about it at work at all, uh, just because the students themselves, I don't think would be very interested, nor would they be allowed to come. So it is something I'm conscious of, and I just want to keep it in a so-called classy fashion, as classy as you can keep it, showing something like the Dark Power or Chopping Mall. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine. But I mean, I can also imagine that, you know, like, a certain type of student of that age that would experience these movies. I mean, it really might ignite something in them, that creative spark as well. So it, it is kind of a shame that we have to sort of tiptoe around the content in this way. Um, I mean, I find that a little bit frustrating, even at a college level too, that sometimes this kind of content that could really blow somebody's mind and put them on a certain path in life and a good path, not like a, I saw chopping mall and I'm going to go shoot up a mall kind of path. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's something I think we're still trying to grapple with as a culture, which is a little unfortunate for sure. Um, so we know where you're not trying to make this a school club, but how are you planning on expanding the club as it grows 
throughout the summer and the spring? So I think that our numbers are great right now. And the main goal for me at the moment is not growth, but maintaining these numbers, because if it stays at this number, we're in good shape. Uh, I think 15 people a night, I would be thrilled if it's 15 people every night that this happens. Uh, but in the future, if we can get enough growth, enough so-called legitimacy, I would love to see a movies in the park situation. Cookville has Dogwood Park where they enjoy showing movies in the summertime. Uh, in the past, I think they've shown Top Gun Maverick, uh, Despicable Me. I'd love if we could get the opportunity to take it in a different direction. Uh, not so much show something so inappropriate because I don't think that would be fair in something like uh, a public park like Dogwood, but I would love it if we could somehow mobilize an effort to do Plan 9 in the park and watch Plan 9 from Outer Space in the park, a film that is devoid of objectionable content. It It's rated G from the 1950s, 1959. It's appropriate. I think it would be cool if we could get the club to do something like that. I don't have any goals that are too ambitious that involve renting out a screening room somewhere so we can see it on a truly big screen. In the library, we have a, and on my marketing, I call it a big-ish screen because it's bigger than medium, but not huge. Uh, I feel like I'm happy with where it's at because at the moment, we're able to do everything for free. Uh, if we can ever get to a point to where we expand it beyond what it is now, that'd be awesome. But if it stays as it is, I would be content as well. Yeah, I mean, again, it's I mean, I almost felt like you were at capacity or close to capacity last week. So who knows what's going to happen this week? I mean, yes, I, I have my concerns for the next meeting. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting there very early for, for, for that meeting. Um, So why do you think it is that in some ways and I saw this report yesterday after I'd already sent you the show prep, but um, IndieWire did a poll that said. 34% of adults prefer to see movies in theaters and that's it. The rest would rather rate for streaming, but I'm seeing this kind of increased interest over the last few years in these group activities. Um, you know, like in, in Nashville, a theater like the Belcourt is kind of getting up to and surpassing its pandemic numbers uh, for repertoire screenings um, for some of the special events that they've been having there. So why do you think these theatrical and group screenings are starting to make a comeback, especially of these movies that people could easily like find on Tubi, like you mentioned earlier? Uh, to connect it to what I discussed earlier when I first talked about how I got into the B-movie scene and why I wanted to start the club, B-movies thrive on community. Uh, shared misery, you could say in one sense, or shared pleasure, which however you prefer. Uh, I think there's nothing like an experience of self-flagellation with some really schlocky celluloid but surrounded by friends and suffering together it creates a real bonding experience just like we see with crow and tom servo and mike on mystery science theater 3000 or like we see with jay rich mike josh and all the gang on red letter media there's just something special about seeing a movie like this together and i'm someone who I'm probably one of the 66% that doesn't care too much about theatrical screenings. Partially that has to do with the theater in Cookville. There's just, I feel like I'm not surrounded by like-minded individuals that want to watch the movie in the same way as me. Like when I do see, go to see a prestigious uh, art film in Cookville, when they do come, there's maybe two or three other people in this huge room. And at that point, it doesn't feel special. Uh, contrast that with a much smaller screen in that tiny room in shopping mall and with 16 people. It's like I'm in somewhere where every seat is filled. Uh, I'm no Marvel fan anymore, but when I saw Avengers Endgame in a packed theater opening night where every seat was filled, that's how I felt watching The Dark Power at the Putnam County Library the other day. Every person was there. Every person was there wanting to see it, and they were fully watching with intent and engagement, something we don't get at the movie theater. We have too many people on their phones chatting with others, and I don't even know why they're there beyond FOMO, fear of missing out. But with our dark power screenings and with our TriStar Trash Cinema screenings, we have people that are watching with purpose. And when you do that together, even with something that might be so-called trash, it is truly special. Well, in terms of special, I also want to talk a little bit about the zine. And I think Geneva shown that a little bit earlier. 
Um, one thing that you're doing that's really cool is you've got Lash LaRue here, who I was just fascinated to learn about at the last screening, uh, Western B-movie star. But you you published this really great zine that is pretty substantial, pretty long for every meeting and give it out to attendees. And it's it's basically original film journalism that I think in this case you wrote most of, right? Yes, this issue, this past issue, uh, I believe I wrote all of it. And I had art contributed by my friends, Eddie Street, a coworker of mine who teaches art and my buddy and old college roommate, Ben Harmon. Uh, but yes, I wrote all the articles within it this past time. But with the next issue, I'm really excited because I have several contributors between you, uh, Jared, between Eddie, the artist from the past issue, uh, as well as another artist named Michaela, uh, who is a former student who does some really cool stuff and has some really cool ambitions as well, which we'll talk about in the zine. But I wanted to make the zine for several reasons. First of all, I wanted TriStar Trash Cinema to have something of an edge more than just come sit down and watch a movie. It becomes its own space of art cultivation where local amateurs, because that's what I am, my writing, I might have a master's degree. I might be an English teacher, but I am not an, a published writer. I, I am an amateur writer. This gives me a chance to dabble in that hobby. That gives my friends who are amateur artists a chance to dabble in that and spread it. And it gives us the glory of publication. Even if it's as small as this, even if we're reaching as small a number as the 16 people in attendance, it's still getting to put our art out there, just like a Jim Wynorski put his film out there, just like Phil Smoot put his art out there. This is us giving our chance to share in our own um, amateur works. And I came to the idea of doing the zine. My favorite uh, podcast on film is The Important Cinema Club with Justin DeClue and Will Sloan. They, they really match uh, humor with academia with their film discourse. But they kept talking about how zines were such a special thing about the screenings they would attend and the clubs they would participate in. How zines gave a sense of community with fandom that social media will never reach. The written word has so much more value than social media posts and Reddit posts. And a zine allows us to create that. Just like Justin and Will in Toronto experienced that, we in Cookville, as small as it may be and as small of a reach as we may have, we get to participate in the cultivation of culture beyond just curation. And I think that's really special. And I just welcome anyone that wants to contribute to the zine and can write better than a kid. Have at it. We would love to have you. Yeah, And I will say, like, I, I would drive down there from Nashville. Um, you know, I know a lot of our audience is based in the Nashville area, but. I think this is this is a kind of there's an energy here that film fans would appreciate. And I think it's worth making the trip to Cookville. So for anybody that wants to come to this, can you give us the the details for yes. Monday's meeting? Yes, our next meeting will be Monday, March 18th at the Putnam County Library in the upper meeting room is what it's called. Uh, the doors will open at 545 and the screening will start at six. Uh, if you want to get there early, you're you're very welcome to to come and chat with us, come and talk with everybody. I can't reserve the room later than a, than 745, so people can't just hang out and chill much longer than that. But we would love to have you there. Uh, it's a great opportunity to meet more like-minded people in Cookville. That's one of the reasons I did it. Uh, I wanted to see who's out there because beyond a T-shirt or something like that, uh, how do you know somebody is into something as niche as B-movies? And I have been shocked at how many people have expressed interest in it and people I didn't even expect. Uh, and it's already connected me with awesome people like, like you, Jared. I never met you before uh, before this adventure. And now I've become acquainted with you. I've become acquainted with other people in the organization. It's just wonderful. And I would love it if others wanted to be a part of this and experience something so niche with others because it truly was special. And that dark power screening, the energy in that room was just special. It was special. That was the magic of the movies that Martin Scorsese talks about in, in Hugo when you have the characters being enamored watching uh, Safety Last on screen in a crowd. That magic was present in the Dark Power screening. So I implore you, Chopping Mall is even better than the Dark Power 
you do not want to miss the once-in-a-lifetime chance to see Chopping Mall with a crowd on a big-ish screen and in a wonderful restor restoration courtesy of Vestron Video. Yeah, I, I really do love that disc for sure. Um, so yeah, definitely come out. I will say the Dark Power Screen is one of my favorite. It's going to be hard to top that in terms of a movie-going event this year, and that happened in February. So hopefully you'll be able to top it at the TriStar Trash Cinema Club. So, uh, Jake, I think you're going to hang around while we uh, get through the rest of this movie material today and do our little Oscar recap. So mm -hmm. if there's anything you want to uh, want to talk about as we're going through these movies, just feel free to, free free to pipe up. So what we're going to do now is talk about the top 10 movies of 2023, according to the pamphleteer. And this was a really hard one. I will say I felt like this year was probably one of the best film years since 1999, which is the one that I've experienced, or since maybe 1973, which I kind of experienced through the magic of DVD. Um, but you wouldn't really know it just because of some of the trends that happened that we've been talking about in the in the last segment, where this was the year that audiences started getting very tired of a lot of these franchise movies. I mean, even a film like Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem, that got great reviews, didn't break out in the same way that one would think a franchise movie like that would. And a movie like Fast X, that's always been a box office powerhouse, kind of struggled a little bit just to justify its existence for the next one. So we had that, but then we also had this massive success of movies like Barbie and Oppenheimer. Um, I also had a really hard time narrowing this list down. So I don't want anybody to think that these are the only 10 movies you should check out this year. Um, I had a list of about 40 other ones that we cut, not that I wrote write-ups of, but that I listed as recommended viewing. I mean, anything from Oppenheimer and Barbie, which did not make my cut, um, just barely. Barbie and Oppenheimer were just right outside of it. Or other movies that I thought were really good this year, like Wonka and the movie Megan, which really kicked the year off with the bang. Did you see Megan, Jake? I did not, but it sounds right up my alley. Is that a Blumhouse production? Yeah, it is. It's like Blumhouse before Blumhouse kind of had this weird Marvel slide like they've been having lately with... Uh, imaginary and night swim and some of these other movies so well um, hey, talking about finances with hollywood the big studios could learn a lot from blumhouse yep so so blumhouse has been really great some of you may or may not know that they basically put a cap on movies of five million dollars and the idea is even if the movie bombs they still make money and when one of those movies like get out just explodes they make so so much money so you know we it's, saw a little bit a of Roger that Foreman approach yeah Roger absolutely. Foreman would very much love that and i'm sure the 98-year-old master himself smiles when he sees people following his lead. And we're seeing that again, too, on, on the opposite side with uh, with Angel Studios, who, you know, the sound of freedom, a lot of people don't realize. And it had a little bit of help from this pay it forward campaign that was a little dubious. But that was a movie that also outperformed Mission Impossible and Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Um, I will say sound of freedom. It's not on the list, but it's my vote for worst movie of last year. Um, I... I just did not like it in any way, shape, or form. And to the fact that I wrote a 3,000 word article about um, my trepidation about Sound of Freedom and maybe some of the trends that are coming in Hollywood. So really without further ado though, I wanna share these, these top 10 films. It took me a long time to craft this. So um, number 10 for me, and I think Geneva's got these up for us and we'll just kind of scroll through or do trailers or whatever. But number 10 for me was Albert Sarah's Pacification. Um, which is a movie that played at the Bell Court very briefly um, and is age restricted, as you can see. I, I really don't know why, but it follows a diplomat in a Polynesian island. And essentially, he's trying to manage the island, manage the culture, and also figure out whether or not France is planning on restarting nuclear testing there. So um, it's like a two and a half hour movie, but it's almost more like a tone poem or a fever dream. And it's one of the most singular experiences I had at the movies last year. Um, the movie just blew me away. I've been a fan of Sarah's other work, like The Death of Louis XIV with Jean-Pierre Lyod. Um, He's one of the most kind of under-recognized filmmakers in international cinema today. So I think Pacification is playing on movie. It might be playing on a couple of other services, but I would suggest you all check it out. Um, number nine for me actually has a local connection. We had the director on Culturally Appropriate back in September, but it is Surprised by Oxford. And before I get into my discussion of Surprised by Oxford, I will say that 
uh, the Southern Oasis Film Festival, which I'm running in Sevier County next week, was lucky enough to get surprised by Oxford as our closing night film. Um, so this is a movie that I saw before it was released because I was doing an article on this filmmaker who's based in Franklin and the, the producer, Ken Carpenter, who made this movie and a lot of other amazing films like The Shift and Finding You. But I can honestly say this is the best movie about faith that I have seen in the contemporary world. Um, I've not seen a movie about faith since Martin Scorsese's Silence that has really moved me in a similar way than Surprised by Oxford. And it's based on Dr. Carolyn Weber's memoir. We also had Dr. Weber on earlier this year to, to talk about the movie and her experience of seeing her life adapted to the screen. But it follows a guarded graduate, graduate student played by Rose Reed, who will also be appearing with Ryan Whitaker at the Southern Oasis Film Festival. And it details how she actually finds her faith while at Oxford, um, reading poems by Milton and meeting um, another like-minded individual who has faith. So it's it's a really great movie, and I'd put it up there with the kind of discussions of faith that are very nuanced that somebody like Scorsese or Bergman would have. Um, I really wish this movie had been the one that grossed two hundred million dollars over Sound of Freedom. Um, it's really unjust the fact that you know a movie that's a lot more dimensional about faith and doesn't really want to ask these hard questions is one that really connects with people. But I think everybody be doing themselves a favor by watching Surprise by Oxford. Um, number eight for me was Sofia Coppola's Priscilla, uh, a movie that I was really frustrated didn't get more Oscar attention. But I feel like that's par for the course for Sofia Coppola. So, uh, Jake, are you a big Sofia Coppola fan? <laughs> I am. I am so enamored with uh, Francis Ford Coppola and the family and the sense of family that permeates his films and his life. Because beyond Sophia, he's got other families, members like Gia, his father Carmine, the composer who did an excellent job on Apocalypse Now. I love Sophia Coppola. And this is one of the 2023 films that I have most meaning to see when I get a chance. Yeah, I mean, it, it blew me away. This is actually one that I saw at the Cookville Theater and it got a really really solid attendance there. Um, and I feel like the audience really liked it. It's probably Sofia Coppola's most accessible movie, but I was really frustrated in the press coverage because everybody was trying to paint it as some kind of rejoinder that demonized Elvis. And for anybody that's seen a Sofia Coppola film like Marie Antoinette or Lost in Translation, that's not something she does. You know, she talks about conflicts and problems. I mean, Marie Antoinette is a great example of that. Um, I'll also say that what really impressed me about Priscilla is it really is a movie about the South. Sofia Coppola has been one of the few filmmakers who's not from the South, like David Gordon Green, who is a director that you know grew up and works predominantly in South Carolina, uh, who made the Halloween movies and The Exorcist Believer, which I really wanted to make my top 10, but ultimately didn't. But with The Beguiled and with Priscilla, she's really shown that she understands the South and is very resistant to a lot of the stereotypes. So those are a lot of the reasons that I put it at number eight on my list. Number seven for me was Eileen, which I think really kind of dovetails really nicely with our discussion we had earlier, uh, because Eileen is kind of like a high art trash movie. Um, it's by William Oldroyd, who really made Florence Pugh's career with the movie Lady Macbeth a few years ago. And it's set in the 1950s in New England. It's got this great sense of tragic re regionalism to it. Um, we don't often see movies that are about the more rural areas on the outskirts of places like Boston or New York City. And this is one of those movies. But Thomas and McKenzie, and probably my favorite performance of the year, plays Eileen. And Shea Wiggum is her dad. He's an alcoholic ex-cop. Um, he's very verbally abusive. She has these fantasies about killing him and killing herself. And she works as a prison guard and becomes enamored with Anne Hathaway's Harvard-educated Freudian analyst who comes and gets herself in some trouble and makes Eileen complicit in it. So it's part film noir. It's kind of part trashy exploitation movie, but it's gorgeous and amazing. Um, it also was one of the movies that like came out December 8th and it was gone before Wonka came out a week later, unfortunately. But I absolutely love, love, love this movie. Uh, number six for me is Wes Anderson's Asteroid City. Um, for those of you that watch the Oscars, you know, Wes Anderson, after this amazing career that is about to go on 30 years, finally won his first Oscar on Sunday night for his Netflix short um, and didn't even bother to come to the ceremony, which I thought was pretty hilarious. But Asteroid City is probably my favorite Wes Anderson film. Uh, have you had a chance to see this one, Jake? I haven't. And one of my darkest confessions as a film fan is that I have seen very little Wes Anderson. 
Well, I think he's probably the most, and I talked about this in the piece that I wrote uh, for the pamphleteer on Asteroid City, which I think Geneva's got pulled up here, but Wes Anderson seems like a very innocuous twee director, but you know, Asteroid City is not a movie like that. It's a movie about deep traumas and about acknowledging trauma. And it's also probably my favorite post-pandemic movie. Uh, there's this nice allegorical touch with Jeffrey Wright's character, who had an amazing year with movies like American Fiction. Um, I really liked his performance in this one equally to the one in American Fiction. But Asteroid City, probably one of Wes Anderson's best movies. And for a while, at least, it was number one on my list this year. It just really got toppled toward the end of the year. Number five for me is The Holdovers, which... I didn't really need to give my endorsement because it got nominated for a lot of Oscars. What frustrated me about The Holdovers, though, is that it's probably director Alexander Payne's most accessible movie. This movie should have also been like a hundred million dollar hit. It was it's, it's a charming movie. It's hilarious. It's got a lot of heart, even though it's incredibly caustic. It reminds me of like a Hal Ashby movie from the 70s when Hal Ashby was at his peak. But it's also distinctly an Alexander Payne movie. And Alexander Payne movies have done very well in the past. I mean, About Schmidt made $60 million. His movie Sideways made $80 million. This one was lucky to crack 20. And there was no reason this shouldn't have been a $150 million surprise hit like Good Will Hunting. And that kind of brings me some concerns about movie going and the streaming experience. Because the thing that I found the most frustrating out of all of these frustrating things is I saw The Holdovers. It got a release in like early November. And it got a release in a lot of theaters and actually film, which it was shot on. To mimic the look of the 70s but this movie was available on streaming at the very beginning of december for at home rental and it was on peacock on december 26th but it's a holiday movie this was a movie that should have come out in november and been making 10 20 million dollars a weekend and really had that groundswell but the studio just dropped it and it's insulting to the work to me um this movie is about a kind of loser boarding school teacher who had a rough life and hates his students and hates everything, but teaches at this prestigious academy. And, you know, somebody that knows a little bit about like private educational institutions with all these great jokes about how there's a big Christmas tree that they spend all this money on. And when the parents leave, they resell the Christmas tree <laughs> to make some extra cash and things like that. But it's about the students, the, the bond that this teacher has with a student after he's given the uh, duty to stay back behind on Christmas vacation because he doesn't have any loved ones or anybody who really likes him that much at all. Um, and he does that because of the fact that he refuses to pass this uh, idiot son of a senator. So there's a lot of discussion about like elitism and the Ivy League class in this movie. But as I said, it's a movie that has a lot of heart. Uh, Divine Joy Randolph, who won an Oscar, absolutely deserved it. Um, one of the most amazing performances of the year. So if you haven't had a chance to check out The Holdovers, I'd recommend you do it. Um, number four should be no surprise to uh, the viewers of our show because it is The Iron Claw, which we had a really nice discussion of a few weeks ago um, with Oliver Bateman when he was on, uh, on the show. Oliver Bateman, the wrestling journalist, uh, came on. And we had differing opinions about The Iron Claw, but Zac Efron in this movie is fantastic. This was another one that I feel like really should have broken out into that $100 million box office sensation, but didn't. Um, as Oliver and I talked about on the show, like I don't know how the boys in the boat almost made $60 million, being the most like milk toast maudlin movie George Clooney's ever made. And this one struggled at the box office. It just blows my mind. Um, like why audiences were seeing the boys in the boat to that level. I mean, the boys in the boat is still in some theaters. It's not a bad movie, but it makes no sense to me. Um, so the Iron Claw is about the Von Erich wrestling clan. Are you a wrestling fan, Jake? I confess that I have had some big phases in my life, but no longer. Yeah, this is something I never really got into as a kid, but I was just captivated by this movie. Um, you know, some of it might be that Glenn Jacobs, uh, the, the former wrestler Kane, and I think sometimes still wrestlers, the the mayor of Knox County, and has appeared in some of our uh, some of our articles before, but. Um, Zach Efron's performance in this movie just like changed my entire perception of Zach Efron. I've always enjoyed him. I've always thought he was funny in movies like Neighbors, but the gravitas that he brings to this role, the way he just completely changed himself is just, it, it's, it's utterly impressive. Um, 
I mean, Daniel Day Lewis level of acting here from Zach Efron, which is something I never thought I would have said back in the high school musical days. Um, but everything about this movie is great. It's another movie that really understands the South and its sense of place. So definitely check it out. Um, number three for me was May, December, the Todd Haynes film with Julianne Moore and Natalie Portman. There was this really nice kind of sub genre of movies this year with Anatomy of a Fall, a movie that got a lot more attention after winning Khan and winning the best original screenplay at the Oscars on Sunday. Movies that are about sort of our obsession with these, and I will say the word trash pejoratively here, but these trashy murder documentaries, the, the Murdoch documentaries, and sort of like the People magazine adaptations that people just consume mindlessly. And I've got more of an ethical problem with that kind of violence than I do something like Chopping Mall or Hostel or Thanksgiving, you know, which is another movie I really wanted to put on my top 10 for this year. Um, that sort of just like violence as entertainment that no one even thinks about, that no one is shocked by, probably one of the biggest cancers on our culture. And I loved what Anatomy of a Fall did in a very clinical way, where it analyzed the trial aspect of that and how invasive trials are to people's individual lives. But May, December was the blowtorch to this that I always wanted to see. It's high comedy from the very beginning when Julianne Moore is freaking out about her hot dogs. Natalie Portman, who's an actress that I don't really like all of that much, but I, you know, begrudgingly have to say when she turns in a performance like this or in a movie like Jackie, you know, she knows what she's doing, um, plays this very predatory actress who's playing a woman based on Mary Kay Letourneau from the 1990s who went to jail for the statutory rape of one of her students that she ultimately married and had kids with. Um, and I think she recently died as well. But um, this movie really just like gets into that tawdriness and examines it and makes us ask these big ethical questions of like, is the relationship between this Mary Kay Letourneau figure and the husband that she's still with, is that unethical or is what Natalie Portman is doing, exploiting this and bringing back these old wounds? Is that ethical? Um, you know, it's a movie that makes people uncomfortable on purpose. And I think that's why it didn't get as much Oscar attention because it was very critical of its own audience. You know, people that were just, and Netflix, as much as I hate to say it, was the perfect place for this movie to premiere because it was like somebody's watching their murder show. They turn on May, December, and then they're like, ooh, I feel icky about myself and I don't know why. I mean, that's kind of like what art is supposed to do. So um, I was for a long time this year, thought May, December was going to be my number one film of the year. Um, but then I saw the last two that I needed to see, which were the zone of interest. And the one I'm going to talk about at the very end, number two was the zone of interest for me. I don't want to get into this movie that much because it's a film that has to be experienced. Um, this was a movie that, you know, I was glad I saw with an audience that was half full because it's a movie that I feel like needs to be watched with people, but the level of detachment that it brings to the Holocaust and to evil acts is just remarkable. Like I've never seen another movie like this one in my entire life. It's a movie people are going to talk about years to come um, whenever they've forgotten about a lot of these best picture nominees. And my number one of the year, which I have the article in the pamphleteer about today is Yorgos Linthimos's Poor Things. And I know Jake, you've not seen the movie yet, but if you've been following the online discourse from the left and the right, because I find all of it very maddening. And that's what I wrote about this morning. Would, would that discourse, I, I'm mostly unplugged from social media. Would that discourse have to be with its portrayal of sex? So on, on one hand, there's this feminist backlash about the movie um, from the left. And then now there's this backlash that Emma Stone did not deserve the Oscar because Lily Gladstone should have gotten it because she was the first Native American nominated. But then on the right, and I've got this pulled up, this is from um, the blog of Students for Life. Um, Emma Stone thanked her daughter for poor things, Oscar win, an egregious late-term abortion, pedophilia, and sexual abuse praising movie. That's been sort of the, the right's response to poor things. So you know, I, I, I'm very frustrated in general by our culture, this idea that we have to watch a movie and that movie has to reinforce our values. That's not I, what a movie is supposed to do. I, I completely agree with that. And I'll say um, on the topic of that, I have recently been rewatching all the films of S. Craig Zoller, a filmmaker who the subtext of his work is explicitly counter to my own beliefs. But I cannot deny that he is making incredible work. And I haven't seen Poor Things, but sure, it would have been it would have been cool if a Native American 
Native American won Best Actress at the Oscars. Uh, I'm far more sympathetic to the comments the left is making than the right is making. Uh, I haven't seen the film, so I can't entirely comment. But I think online film discourse is just a complete plague. Uh, it can be such a complete plague. And I love having good places like the pamphleteer out here giving true nuanced opinions uh, through people like yourself, Jared. You're, you're doing a great job and you're making this space so much better than what this poor thing's discourse could be. And I mean, the, the, here's the, the thing with the right that just infuriates me about this movie. It's the same stuff that infuriated me about Barbie with like Ben Shapiro burning the doll or Jack Pasebic talking about it in a way that was like a willful misreading or maybe he just is that ignorant. Or uh, my favorite, who I got banned on Twitter from, Peachy Keenan, who had been reviewing the movie for a month and I, I kind of broke the news that she actually hadn't seen the movie yet. And she'd been going on Fox News talking about how it was going to uh, indoctrinate your children and all this other bullshit. So um, Let, let's not forget that Ben Shapiro is a failed screenwriter, too. He tried to break into the industry and now he's vindictive towards it because of that. Yeah. And I mean, I think there's 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 a, there's a lot to be said for that. And I mean, I, you could just tell the irritation that Barbie was doing so well really got to him. Um, but, you know, for for this movie, too, um, I'm just I'm absolutely sort of in, in, infuriated that nobody is taking a look at what culture actually means because you hear from the right all the time. Like we need to get back to the classics. We need to get back to the great works of the British empire and things like this. Um, but I've never seen a movie more accurately be in the spirit of the works of the British empire, the classic works like Humphrey Clinker and Gulliver's travels and Tristram Shandy or the romantic works, you know, these body kind of nasty books that you read today and are shocked by. Um, that's what Poor Things is, and that's what Poor Things is about. So there's this massive level of hypocrisy for me with, with, with the right saying that we've got to get back to the classics and teach the classics. And it's very clear that if they'd read these books, they would know what the classics actually contain. And when they're confronted with a movie like Poor Things, they're just completely angry over the content like it's destroying our culture when it's about the fact you know the book is by a scottish writer who is thinking about the place of people that were colonized like the scots in the british empire and how that there's this ambivalence between this amazing form of discourse that came out of the english novel and their own place in it i, I would it also is, add that a lot of the people on the right that um, remark how much they care about Western culture and art have not consumed or read such art. Yeah, like I the mean, books you mentioned, I am highly, highly doubtful Matt Walsh has read any of those. Yeah, I mean, I want to, I want to see the book report from Matt Walsh on Humphrey Clinker, like on my desk tomorrow. I mean, you should actually be the one to be saying that, but, <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, and, you know, uh, I, I challenge you, Matt. Yeah, the, the the left's discourse has been like equally frustrating for me too, um, because. You can almost tell from a lot of these people that are yelling about Lily Gladstone, they're not even seen Killers of the Flower Moon. Like they probably were on their phones through half of it anyway. So, I mean, I feel like art is not supposed to reinforce your beliefs. It's supposed to make you expand your beliefs. And that's one of the reasons that we've lost a common culture in this country is because of the fact that somehow we've forgotten that. You would think a movie like Oppenheimer or Barbie would bring us together, but we're still having these inane debates about why are there no Japanese people in Oppenheimer? You know, why don't you watch Oppenheimer and Godzilla minus one and think about how they go together instead of making this movie do all these things for you. Absolutely. So anyway, <laughs> that is my rant. I would say go see poor things. Um, I think it's available on streaming now. Um, I would not watch it with my grandparents. I would say um, Emma Stone gives a fully committed performance and every, every meaning of that word. Um, there's some like Jess Franco trash cinema getting very close to that imagery in this movie, but She's great. Mark Ruffalo, great in it. Um, Jared Carmichael, great. The cast is all wonderful. Um, Willem Dafoe, especially as the character Godwin or God, uh, really, really good in that movie too. So that's my pick. I've been holding on to it for three months. Um, we're going to end the show today with the weekly film rundown, as always. And there's a host of releases, and some of these are just like bafflingly weird. We're not going to talk about all of them. Um, I don't know if you saw the movie Saint Maud, Jake. Did you happen to see that A24 release? Yes, I did. I uh, I remember during COVID when it was supposed to come out and it was delayed and I was really unhappy. And when I finally got to watch it, it's something. 
It's yeah, I mean, I built it up so long that I was just in quarantine. Like, when do I get to watch St. Maude? And I don't know if I didn't enjoy it because of the fact that I just hyped it up too much or if I didn't enjoy it because it was just a strange movie. But I will say I'm looking forward to Rose Glass's new movie, Love Lies Bleeding, which opens nationwide today. And I'm looking forward to it for a couple of reasons. One, it is an A24 release, but you know it also has my favorite actress, Kristen Stewart, in it. Um, and Kristen Stewart plays a gym manager and she falls in love with a bodybuilder and they're ingesting some kind of weird steroid substance and they have this mafia underworld that they descend into. Um, it just looks weird and amazing and really like nothing else out in theaters right now. So I'm glad these movies are being made. I'm really glad that these movies are coming out and they're being released nationwide. And I hope that they do really well. Um, so this one's pick of the week for me. Um, we have some others that are pretty interesting. And we also have some others that are playing at the bell court that I would definitely recommend people see. One of these is another movie that was recently delayed called Problemista. And this one was delayed by the actor's strike. It's another A24 film. Um, hasn't really gotten as much fanfare. Um, this one features Tilda Swinton kind of doing a riff on The Devil Wears Prada for the art world. And it is about an El Salvadorian immigrant who wants to be a toy maker and ends up getting caught up in this visa situation where Tilda Swinton is basically in charge of his fate. And it's a coming of age story. And looks really, really great. It's playing at the Bell Court. I don't know if it's going to be expanding soon. Um, another film that's playing at the Bell Court that looks really interesting is the Chilean Western The Settlers, which is about a group of settlers led by a couple of British commanders. And they are tasked with clearing the indigenous population off of this land baron's property. It looks pretty good as well. Um, we also have... Mark Wahlberg, whose recent career I've not really been able to explain as much because he's kind of teetering between these big budget blockbusters that are making money like Uncharted and this movie, Arthur the King, where he plays a triathlete. Samu Liu is in this too, from Shang-Chi and from Barbie. Um, and it's one of these like inspirational dog movies. Um, it looks like it's really well shot. It looks like it might be be kind of cool, but it's not something that I'm particularly excited about seeing. Um, another one that is coming out is the American Society of Magical Negroes. And this was a film by Focus Features that has just gotten critically lambasted. This was another one that caused a lot of pushback when the trailer came out. Um, it looks very on the nose. It looks like one of those movies that is really just sort of intervening and has kind of a very one dimensional take on issues. And I'm getting that impression. It's going to be interesting to see how this one does at the box office. But in terms of the stuff that the Bell Court is doing this week, I'm really excited about it. Um, they've got a couple series happening. One is a tribute to Ennio Morricone. And they, they had the documentary Ennio play last week, which we talked about on the show. Um, they're going to be showing various movies from throughout his career during their Music City Mondays. And this week happens to be Quentin Tarantino's The Hateful Eight which I think was one of the last movies that he did the score for. He won an Oscar for as well. Mm -hmm. um, Hateful Eight's one of Tarantino's movies that kind of like Grindhouse, Death Proof. It made money, but it came out during the first Star Wars. And I feel like in a lot of ways, it didn't get the attention. I'll have to admit, like when I saw this movie, it took me a few years to really learn to like it as much as I do now. Um, it wasn't instantaneous where I was blown away like I was with Once Upon a Time on Hollywood or um, Kill Bill or Inglorious Bastards. But I do think this is one of Tarantino's best movies. Um, it's long. It's taxing. Um, it really defies a lot of conventions. So how do you feel about The Hateful Eight? I am a huge fan of The Hateful Eight. Uh, I think that perhaps more, with the exception probably being Reservoir Dogs in my mind, I think that The Hateful Eight is such an incredible example of Quentin the writer. Uh it is a glorified stage play in so many sequences where it's just characters bouncing off one another and each character representing an archetype of the old West, like Bruce Dern, who is incredible as the old Confederate general or the great underrated Walton Goggins or Samuel L. Jackson or Kurt Russell or Jennifer and Jason Lee in an Oscar nominated turn. It's just got some incredible, incredible work. And the Morricone score, like you brought up, it is so perfect to see Morricone directly involved in a Tarantino project 
following his sampling of his work, such as in the opening scene of Inglorious Bastards, when he borrows a track from the 1966 spaghetti western, The Big Gun Down, or in Kill Bill Volume 2, where he uses songs from The Mercenary, which Morcone scored for director Sergio Corbucci, or the theme and work from Navajo Joe, when Bill dies at the end of Kill Bill Volume 2. Morricone and Hateful Eight are just great stuff. And I'd also like to plug one more Morricone project I rewatched the other day. I rewatched Brian De Palma's Casualties of War. And Morricone's score in that movie is so unsung. The final sequence where Michael J. Fox tries to reckon with this Asian American woman he comes across with following his tour in Vietnam and the Morricone score soaring over it, it it's some of Brian De Palma's best cinema and the Morricone track. Morricone's tracks elevate everything so much higher. And that's what the score is meant to do. So many films would not work without that score. Steven Spielberg said that about Raiders of the Lost Ark with John Williams score. But watching Casualties of War, such an underrated De Palma film and Morricone score shows how great Morricone was. Yeah. And so Ennio played last week. This one's playing this week. And then we have Terrence Malick's Days of Heaven as the final in the uh, Morricone series, which, you know, not exactly a slotch of a movie, that one, you know? I love um, Mason Malick. So the Belcourt is also doing this really amazing set of trilogies. We talked about Richard Linklater's Before Trilogy last week on the show. But this week they have uh, Isajiro Ozu's The Noriko Trilogy, which is Tokyo Story, Late Spring, and Early Summer. Um, these are all restored prints of these amazing Japanese movies. Um, a lot of post-war Japanese cinema people know from Akira Kurosawa and Seven Samurai and the movies that he made with Shiro Mifune. But Ozu is kind of the, the more laid back, at least in terms of style. He's famous for having a very stable camera. He's famous for these domestic dramas. And we don't really see somebody like Kurosawa get to these domestic dramas until a movie like High and Low. So if you've not seen an Ozu movie, there really isn't a better time to see an Ozu movie than at the Bell Court in a restored print this weekend. Um, and I'm going to end since Jake, you're sticking around. We've got a couple of really weird films. Um, one is a movie called Thorns, which I didn't give Geneva a trailer for, but I just wanted to read the summary really quickly. An ex-priest working for NASA is sent to investigate a remote observatory that went silent after receiving a radio signal from deep space. He discovers that signal has set in motion the biblical end of times. So I I may go see this movie this weekend. I got a lot of film festival planning to do, but it just sounds incredibly nuts. Do you, do you know who the production company or if that's I, a big film, an exploitation film? What is I that? know nothing about it. It just is showing up in a couple of theaters. It's going to be playing at Regal Hollywood 27. It's playing in Knoxville at the Regal Pinnacle. So if I get a chance, I'm going to go check this one out. Um, the Bell Court also has a really good double feature for Midnight's this week. Um, and Jake, it might be a little young for this, but uh, I remember when Final Destination came out and I remember that one made millennials terrified of getting on an airplane and final destination two made millennials really afraid or three. Yeah. Roller three coasters. Made, yeah. Roller coasters and driving behind trucks with logs on them. So I think in a lot of ways, millennial Gen Z anxieties could be traced back to final destination and Jeffrey Reddick creating the series, but that's playing tonight at the bell court at midnight. And we have a much lesser known movie. That sounds like something you would program called nightmare beach. Yes. Uh, It'll be playing Saturday. Yes. Yes. Uh, I believe that is a production that involves Umberto Lindsay, a very good, he, he did some, whether or not he did directed the film is disputed or not. Uh, but yes, I, I do enjoy the works of Umberto Lindsay and I, I do own a, uh, a very good copy of Nightmare Beach. Yeah. And so Nightmare Beach is, it's, it's kind of like an American giallo, but it has the, has a lot of the same crew. So this movie came out in the 80s, and basically it's a spring break movie. Um, and we've got this killer that's like got a motorcycle helmet on, and he's just like slashing his way through South Florida. So I've, I've not had a chance to see this movie. I think if I get a chance, that might be something fun to do, the Belcourt Midnights. Um, but if you've been to a Belcourt Midnight show before, I know it's kind of a long drive from Cookville, but... The crowd is wild there, and it's really a fantastic experience, very similar to what you're doing. Um, so point being, this weird weekend with the weather, and is it spring, is it not spring? There's a lot of movies to go see. Um, 
And there's definitely movies to go see on Monday. As much as The Hateful Eight appeals to us, I'm going to be at Chopping Mall. So, Jake, thanks so much for joining us on our show. And that really brings us to the end of our uh, time here on Culturally Appropriate today. So whatever y'all get up to this weekend, give it some thought and have a good one. Bye.